All right. Good afternoon, Bill. Can everyone hear me okay? You still awake? It's the last <laughs> session. Yeah? Almost. You're awfully quiet for a bunch of people who are awake. Okay. So this is the debugger and diagnostics tips and trips talk. Um, you have myself, Andy Stillens. I'm a lead PM on the team that builds some of these tools. And so we're really excited here today to show you some of the stuff that you can go and use in your everyday life. And with me, I have Leslie. Hi, yeah, I'm Leslie. I'm a program manager on the debugging team, so we work on the same team. And uh, today we're gonna hopefully show you some new tips and tricks that you can use in Visual Studio 2019 to make your debugging experience a lot more efficient and happier one. Yeah, as well as some old classics that have been there in VS for a while. So the whole point of this talk is to give you guys some things to learn about that you can apply back in your job, back when you're debugging, you know, uh, back in uh, your office. So everyone here should learn something new. And to bet that, I want to make a bet with you. I want to bet that everyone here will learn at least one new thing by the end of this talk. And to bat that up, back that up, because a bet's no good unless there's something at stake, I have some very precious Tim Tams here. <laughs> So is anyone familiar? This is Australia's finest export. <laughs> I'm not Australian, I, even I appreciate them. They're called biscuits or cookies if you're American. Um, and whenever they go in the team room, they are gone instantly. Um, so we, we are incentivized to make sure you learn something new in this talk. Uh, if not, you can see us in the booth tomorrow. <laughs> so with that, who wants to see some slides? You excited for slides? Yeah, yeah. slides. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you are going to be so disappointed because we have nothing in the way of slides. Uh, yeah. So instead, Leslie's going to get started with some demos, which is much better. All right, me. yeah, I agree. So let's just get started. Yep, so for the remainder of this talk, we're going to be using Visual Studio 2019. And we're also going to be using this ASP.NET Core application that will give me a random list of books that I can choose to read and add to my shelf or choose not to read and not add them to my shelf. Yeah. We so, like to think of this as the Tinder for books. Yeah. <laughs> so because this app was hastily put together, there are several bugs strewn throughout it, which is not great. So we're going to try to use some of the tools available to us in Visual Studio in order to figure these out. But first, there's one thing I would like to add to my overall debugging environment to make my debugging experience a little bit easier on myself. So I'm going to go into Visual Studio first, and we're going to set a breakpoint at the start of this constructor here, and I'm going to restart my debugging session. And so in this book manager constructor, I am taking in a JSON file that stores all the book contents that this app uses, converts each of those into a book object, and then we'll store each of those books inside a list. So the first thing I want to do is just inspect that book list after it's been filled up, which in order to do that, I need to go to the end of this function. So at first glance, all I could, I could just you know, spam F10 until I go to the line that I want. But you know, that's kind of tedious, especially since I have this for loop in the middle here, and I'd have to go through the for loop in order to get to the end of this function. So as an alternative, I can use an empty tool called run to click which I can use by hovering over the line I want to go to. And then when you do that, you'll notice this green icon that appears, and then it'll prompt me to run my execution up to here. And when I do that, Visual Studio will run up all the lines of code up to that given line. So super nifty. It's kind of like fast forwarding through your code without having to you know, pause it line by line. Yeah. Or if you've ever set a breakpoint just to run to it to remove it, this is what this feature is for, so that you don't have to set those breakpoints and remember to remove them. Yeah. Yep, so from there, I'm going to pull up the data tip associated with this books list that I have here. And because I'm going to use this um, more than once, I'm going to pin it with this pin icon here. And when I do that, I can hover away from it, and it'll still be there. And even if I start a new debugging session, it'll also still be there. So as long as I choose to keep it around, that's as long as it'll stick around for. So if I were to start inspecting individual books one by one that's in this list, at first glance, this is not very helpful, you might have noticed. So I'm just getting the type of book here, which I already know it's going to be a, a book object. So I would like to get some more useful information. And this goes for if I were looking at the same list inside the locals window, for instance. So a cool feature that I really like, it's one of my favorite features that I can use, is something called the debugger display attribute, which in order to use this, I need to stop debugging real fast and navigate to where I defined my book class. And we're going to add some debugger display syntax at the top of this class. 
All right, and then in the curly brackets here, I want to return the value of a property. So in this case, I would like to view my book objects by a more specific property. So if I wanted to view books by their name, I can do that. So I'm gonna use the property title, which gives me the name of the book. And then if you're familiar with format specifiers, these are um, little keywords that you can use in like the autos watch or locals windows, as well as debugger display here where that let you temporarily view your objects and their values in a different way. So if I wanted to remove the quotation marks around the string that's gonna be returned to me, then I can use NQ here, and that will get the job done. And so from there, I'm gonna restart my debugging session, and hopefully we'll see some more useful information. So how many people have used collections before and had that thing where you're just scrolling for a list and all you see is types? Right. Pretty much everyone, right? You do some sort of collection and seen this experience? It's fun, right? You, you love it? <laughs> cool. All right. So once again, I'm going to use run to click to go to the end of this function. And from there, this time, if I expand this data tip, you'll notice I get a lot more helpful information. I can just, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, super cool, I love it. I use this feature all the time. Um, same thing, I can also view this in um, the watch window. So what debugger display does is I can pick and choose which properties that I want to view my object with and Visual Studio will propagate or bubble those properties up to the top of my debugger windows. And for those of you wondering, is this a 2019 exclusive? I am pleased to tell you that this has been around since the dawn of time. It's in like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah we have to, the current source control system doesn't even know how far back yeah. this went, so. <laughs> so it's been around for a while, so you should definitely check it out no matter what version of Visual Studio you're using. Yeah. And it's a really nice feature because it's part of your source code, so you check it in and every other developer on your team benefits from it. And, and so what Leslie just showed for debugger display, there's even more extensible stuff. So if you want to do fancier things like uh, compute, compute properties and stuff like that, there's ways to do that and you can look online. And even in, if you want to change the default views of built-in objects, so stuff you don't own, there's also something called auto expression evaluation. Uh, you can pop by the booth if you're really interested to know more about that, but you can even change the visualization of other people's code where you can't you know, write, check in that code, perhaps it's legacy, perhaps it's old, perhaps someone else's, where it's just the runtime. Yep. Pretty nifty. So from there, uh, now that I've finished inspecting my books list, I actually want to take a look at my JSON contents, which are currently being stored in this variable here called string JSON. And so uh, because I'm, I've reached the end of this method here, this variable is currently out of scope. So normally I could just restart and create a new debugging session, but another alternative I can use is a feature called set to next statement. So if you're stepping through your code, you might have noticed this yellow um, execution arrow that appears as you go, and this is telling you the next line that's about to be executed. But with set to next statement, you can pick and choose which lines you want to have executed next. So this is really nice if you want to try out different execution flows or just quickly go back and reinspect certain variables. So I'm gonna use that in order to return to this JSON variable. So there's two ways I can do this. I can either drag this execution arrow up to the line that I want to execute next, or I can navigate to the line that I want to travel to, and then just as if I were about to use run to click again, I can hold the control key, and it'll turn into a yellow arrow instead of a green one, and I can set my next statement to here, and it'll do the same thing. So really cool, but keep in mind that if you use this at your own risk, because this can easily corrupt your code. This is not the same as rewinding and uh, stepping back to a previous line. This is kind of essentially re-executing code in some degree. So this can easily corrupt your code depending on where you're setting your next statement to, but it's really great for just quick inspection type things like that and um, checking out alternative execution flows. So from there, I am going to look at my JSON string, and just right off the bat, this is not helpful at all. So it's formatted as a JSON string, right? And on top of that, it's very long, so it's cutting off um, this column here. So another tool I can use is a text, visual, a text visualizer that's available in Visual Studio, which I can view all of them by expanding this drop down here next to this magnifying glass icon. And here, Visual Studio will give me a default list of visualizers I can use. So for instance, if I had a string that is formatted originally for XML, then I can check out the XML visualizer. But in this case, I'm gonna use the JSON visualizer. 
And when I do that, I get this nifty little pop-up that will let me view the string in its intended format, which is super nice. And as an added bonus, because I'm using the JSON one and I'm looking at JSON that has a list in it, I can expand and collapse each one of these two. Also nifty if maybe you just have a giant block of text that's being stored in a variable, so you can use the standard text visualizer as well if you wanted to view the entire string and um, its completion. Yeah, without the quotes. So if you ever try to copy something out of the watch window and copy the quotes, this also renders the text. So you see the rendered text as you know someone would see it in your application without like slash rs and slash ends and yep. stuff. Yeah. All right, so from there, I have finished setting up my debugging environment with debugger display, which is awesome. So hopefully that should save me some time when I go and use it later. And now let's try to debug some of the issues that I'm experiencing in my app. So always the awkward pause as I was uh, <laughs> ISS Express and reading list. This is where you normally go check Reddit. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't think you guys want us to do that, so. <laughs> Cool, so um, the first bug that I am noticing currently is uh, revolving around this add all books to my shelf function. So when I click on this, it's supposed to add all the books that could possibly be recommended to me and add them to my shelf by default. But when I do that, I'm noticing that only about half of them are being displayed. So I have 100 books that could possibly be added to my shelf and it looks like I'm only getting 50. And just to double check, if I were to click on this rate books page, it should give me a notification telling me that that page is empty and it no longer has books to give me. But instead, I get the lovely out of range exception error here. So that's telling me that, okay, so my code thinks that there's something, that there's still books hanging around somewhere that can be recommended to me. Like so. Your code has a bug? Uh, no, uh, shocker. Shock. <laughs> Never had this happen before. Yep, I wish. I wish things could just, you know, magically work out on the first go around, but. It's not how That's life why works. why we have a debugger. Yep. So I'm gonna, to get to the bottom of this, I'm just gonna hone in on the specific function, which control F is not working right now, that's fun. So, okay, then we'll just scroll down until I find it. That fun moment when control F just decides, nope, not today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. All right. So from here, I'm looking into my add all to shelf function. And in this function, I am taking all of those books that could be recommended to me, which are currently being stored in my neutral books list, and then moving all of them into my shelled books list. And then at the end of each iteration, I'm deleting each book from the neutral books list. So I'm thinking there's something going wrong with this for loop here, so let's try to use some debugging tools to figure this out. Okay, so show of hands, who likes print statements? No one, all no right. No one, this is the only crowd that doesn't. <laughs> okay, so. No printf, no debug right lines, <laughs> console log. Wow, okay, cool. So <laughs> way back when I used to be obsessed with print statements, I would just put them all over my code um, in college and stuff, like nobody taught me how to use the debugger, so. You know, just print statements polluting my code everywhere and then trying to remember to delete them can always be a pain. So an alternative that I can use without having to modify my code is something called a trace point. And um, trace points do the, just that. They'll allow me to print to my output window to get information without having to modify my code. So to do that, I'm gonna set a basic breakpoint at the start of my for loop here. And then I'm gonna hover over to settings then I'm gonna check the actions here. And then where it says log a message to the output window, I can tell Visual Studio to print whatever I want. So in this case, I want to see how far this for loop goes before it decides to stop because I have the feeling it's stopping prematurely. So I'm gonna type in index and then colon and then in the brackets here, which like debugger display will return the value of a variable that I specify. I'm gonna say I, hit enter. And I know that the trace point's been, uh, been created because I get this diamond icon here instead of the traditional circle breakpoint icon that I normally get. And from there, I'm gonna restart my session and repeat that same add all to shelf action to see if I get anything more useful. Okay, 
so from there, we're going to add all the books to my shelf again. Might take a little longer this time since it needs to print all that information I just told Visual Studio to print. And you'll notice that I didn't actually experience a break in my code when that happened, and that's because I left the continue execution option open, um, checked when I created this trace point. But if you wanted your, your code to stop every time you print a statement, you can do that as well. So if I go into the output window here, I can scroll up and I'll see the stuff that I told Visual Studio to print out, which is super nice. Um, if you feel like the output window, there's too much going on in there, another way that you can check it is by going into the Diagnostics Tools window, which I can search for using the nifty universal search feature up here. And I can actually filter them out under events here. So I'll get rid of a few things and there are my trace points. So one reason why you shouldn't close the Diagnostics Tools window when you start debugging, um, it's pretty nice. All right, so from there, I'm going to, if I scroll down to the last statement that was printed, I'm noticing that my index value stops when i is equal to 49. So that's about half of what it should be. It should be stopping when i is equal to 99 in my case. So at this point, I think I just want to step through the last it, uh, few iterations of my for loop here in order to get to the bottom of this. So one way I could do this is to just set a simple breakpoint on this for loop and, you know, spam F10 until I reach I equals uh, 99. But, oh, wait, I wasn't paying attention. I was looking at my phone while I was doing that, and now I skipped it, and now i got to restart my debugging session, right? Not fun. So instead, I can use a conditional breakpoint, which will allow me to have my code break only under a given scenario so I can save myself um, the time and the tedium. So I'm going to go back to where I set this trace point, and under settings, I am going to select conditions here. And you'll notice that I can have both conditions and actions checked. So if you wanted to have something printed to the output window only under a given scenario, you can do that as well. But just to make things simpler, I'm going to uncheck actions here. And from there, I want my conditional expression to be true, which will cause my breakpoint to hit. And it will be true in this case when i equals, let's say, 48. All right, and from there I know the I know that a conditional breakpoint has been hit because has been set because I have the plus icon here, and we're going to restart once more and repeat that same action and hopefully be able to solve the problem from there. Yeah. And so these conditional breakpoints are really awesome in situations where you know they they happen infrequently. Um, like you know a conditional breakpoint isn't something you can use every day. Uh, but it can be a lifesaver when you do need it. And then you can have really complicated expressions in there and evaluate when it's true, when it's not, et cetera. So it's got a full also, like as you see, there's IntelliSense and all that other stuff, like a normal uh, you know, editor window in Visual Studio. Yep. All right, so adding all the books to my shelf again. And I've hit this breakpoint. And you'll notice that instead of starting when i is equal to 0, i is equal to 48, which saves me a lot of time. So from there, if I start stepping through the remainder of this for loop, I'm noticing that as I go through it, when I remove an individual book from my neutral books list at the end of each iteration, it's also decreasing the count of neutral books. And the problem with that is that neutral books dot count is being used as my loop condition, which is, of course, causing my for loop to be cut in half. So now that I've found the issue, I can just fix it by commenting out this last line here, and then I'll just remove all the books from my neutral books list at the very end of my for loop. Okay. And that should fix the problem, but we're going to run it one more time to see if the issue is fixed. And another tip, if you uh, ever want to remove a breakpoint, sorry, if you ever want to disable a breakpoint rather than removing it, you can hold down shift and left click. So if you've like, got to some effort to find the right location for your breakpoint, you just don't want to hit it this time, but you want to keep the breakpoint around for next time, you could have always gone to the breakpoint window, managed it there, but now you can also just hold down the shift and left click to disable the breakpoint. Yep. So you don't have to go through so many windows. All right, so from there, third time's a charm. This time I'm noticing a lot more books that are being displayed here. And then just to double check, I should get that this um, page is empty message. And that's what I get. It's telling me that I've rated all the books in the library already. So super nice. So that was conditional breakpoints and trace points. These are two great alternatives to 
doing print statements if you're into that, or um, just you know having to avoid spamming, continue, or having to constantly have one breakpoint hit when you only want a specific scenario to have it hit. So the next bug that I'm interested in has to do with this property that my book class has called Times Red. So if I choose to add this book to my list, I can click on it, and it'll tell me how many times I've already read this book. So this is kind of a lie. I haven't read Crime and Punishment, to be honest. <laughs> Not even for school? No. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> but um, yeah, so at first glance, something's already up because it's telling me that I've read this book before when it should be set to zero by default. And um, if I click I finish this book, the number of times that I've read it should increase by one. But if I do this and go back to it, it's jumped from having read it one time to having read it four times. So I don't know what's going on there. Either I was just subconsciously reading this book within the last five seconds without my knowledge, or uh, there's something going on with my code, and I think it's the latter. So something, is, something in my code is causing my times read property to be modified, and I don't know where that location is, but we're going to try to solve the issue using Visual Studio. So first up, I'm just going to set a breakpoint at the end of this index function I have here, and this will hit once I refresh my um, home page. And from there, I want to locate the name of the book. And instead of um, expanding for things that I want to use, I can use the brand new search tool that's available for the autos, locals, and watch window here in order to find the book that I want. So I'm going to do crime, and that should find it. And voila. It can save a lot of time if you have like a giant list or a long list of items. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that works for pretty much all languages. So manage code, native code. Uh, yep, you should all be able to use find. Yep. So um, from there, I want to locate its times read property. And I'm actually going to bump up my search depth here to three because it's, a little bit, it's nested a little bit deeper in this list. So do times read. And that will take me there. And you'll notice that it also highlights the keywords that have been found. So if you have if you're searching for keywords that are already visible on screen and you don't want to have to go through executing a full search, then you can do that too. So if I started looking for cover, then it would appear automatically. So you don't have to run through the whole search if it's already visible on screen. So looking at times red, the issue at hand is I need to investigate where times red is being changed or modified without my knowledge. So a feature that I can use that is new to manage code specifically in 2019 is something called a data breakpoint. So um, how many of you are C++ developers who might have heard of data breakpoints already? Anybody? All right, cool. Sweet. So all you managed code users out there, I'm pleased to tell you that this feature is now available for um, .NET Core in 2019. So this is a breakpoint that will allow you to um, halt your code when a specific object's property changes, even if it goes out of scope. So I'm going to use a data breakpoint to pinpoint the location where this times read property is being updated. So to do that, I can right-click on the property and then select the option Break When Value Changes. And from there, I know that the data breakpoint's been created because I get the standard breakpoint icon next to the property. I can also check it in the breakpoints window. And if I scroll up here, an object ID has been created for that specific object. And that's how Visual Studio will be able to keep track of this object if it ever goes out of scope while my program's being executed. So from there, hopefully the next time I do something that causes that property to be modified, I will get some more specific info about where that's happening. So I'm going to click on the book again. And right off the bat, I get a notification telling me that my data breakpoint has been hit. And at first glance, it's already suspicious because there's no reason why times read should be updated just by clicking on the book. And as an added bonus, it will tell me what the previous value of that property was, as, what, as well as the new value. And the great part is that it will redirect me to the exact location where that change occurred. In this case, it's happening in a property setter, but I can use the call stack to determine what exactly called it. So from there, if I go in the call stack window, um, one empty trick I'd like to point out is if you feel like there's too much or too little going on in the call stack, if you're looking at um, each of these lines, then you can just right click on any of them and choose what you want to have displayed. So, if you wanted to see the line numbers, then I can check this. 
if I didn't want to see the um, perimeter, parameter values that are being passed in, then I can also remove that. So super nice. You can customize it however you want. So from there, if I click on the next line in the call stack, I'll see that my get shelled book function here is what's calling this times read um, property setter, which is not right because I already have times read being increased in another function called finished book. So I can comment this out, and that should fix the issue. It's fun when you make typos when you're writing your code. Oh, oops. Right, so we're going to restart, and that should solve the problem. So currently, um, data breakpoints for managed code is exclusive to .NET Core 3.0 or higher, which is currently under preview still as of this session. So if you want to try it out, you're going to have to download the preview version of .NET Core 3.0 and check the ability to um, use preview versions in Visual Studio in order to experiment with it. All right, and I can get rid of this breakpoint. So let's repeat that same action, and maybe I'll get some more, or and maybe the problem will be fixed. So I could choose to read this book, the red and the black. I'm not even sure what the book that is. I don't even know what that book is, yeah. <laughs> we used very public domain books, so like some of them I'm familiar with, others I'm not. And uh, I can choose to finish this book, which means that it should bump up from having read it zero times to one time. And going back to it, that's what happens. So those are data breakpoints, super cool tool, now available for managed code. So there's a lot of great um, scenarios where you can use this for. Um, I just use it in the case of just not knowing where to start in terms of finding out where a modification is occurring. Like maybe one of your teammates has just given you some of their code and you're unfamiliar with their code base, but there's something going on in their code that's causing a property to be modified unexpectedly then you can just quickly use a data breakpoint instead of having to play the trial and error game of um, finding out where those modifications are occurring. You can also use it in the case of finding out where something is being added or, or where something is being added or removed from a list. And you can also just use it in place of a normal breakpoint. Like you can set a breakpoint on a property setter to determine this issue, but keep in mind that that breakpoint could be hit numerous times if you have multiple objects accessing that particular breakpoint. So if you feel like you can address a problem by honing in on just one specific object, then data breakpoints are the way to go. Yeah, and for C++ people, the, the data breakpoints, you have the same UI. Like previously, if you had to do like new data breakpoint and type in the address, the memory location that you cared about, now you can just do the same right-click UI, which is much easier to use. Yep. All right, so there's one more thing that I would like to address before passing the torch on to Andy, and that revolves around this uh, last string that's visible here. So anytime I finish a book, it will tell me the date that I last finished the book on. But in my case, I love to read, so and I love to read multiple multiple books at once. And as a result, I tend to read to finish several books in the same day at times. So I'd like to also see the time that I finished a particular book. So let's go into Visual Studio and investigate this string a bit further. So I'm gonna set a breakpoint at this line that will return that given string. And I can hit that breakpoint by refreshing this page. And you're probably thinking at first glance, this looks like a very convoluted looking line of code. <laughs> we have a function call happening inside the parameter here and just all this other stuff. And I actually don't know what's happening behind this outer function call here. So I want to break down this particular line a bit further so I can see what's happening step by step on this line. So if I wanted to investigate the person.to string um, function first, there's not really a way to do that using the traditional step over or step into options. So what I can do as an alternative is something called step into specific, which is like step into, except I can actually pick which um, function I want to step into first. So to do that, I can right click on this line and go to step into specific. And as you can see, there's a lot of options to choose from, but I'm going to go to this person.to string. And just as if you were stepping into a function using the traditional step into option, um, it'll take me into that particular method. And from there, it's just returning the string name that I specify, so no big there. Just step through it and get out of it, and I'm back at that line. 
So from there, I want to step into this finish to string function call instead. So I'm going to right click. We're going to do step into specific again and go there. And here we get some string concatenation stuff going on. So one, um, one thing I'd like to do first is just see what's being returned in both cases. And if I wanted to review a value that's being returned from a function, normally I guess that would mean having to stop my debugging session and then set it to an arbitrary variable probably and then just check what's being stored in the variable. But what I can use instead are several options. So I can go step to the end of my function And then from there, I can go into the autos window. And you'll notice that here I have the function name and this keyword that says returned on it. And that will give me the return value right off the bat without have me having to do an, any intermediate, intermediary steps in order to see what that looks like. Yeah. <laughs> so that's super sweet. And um, from there, another alternative I can use is, of course, the watch window for the same exact thing. So if I wanted to add some format specifiers to that on, as an added bonus, then um, watch window could be the way to go. And to do that, I can just do dollar sign return value, and that will give me the same result. That's super nice. And so given the format specifiers, which again will let me change how I view my, uh, my values in this window, I can do that by adding a comma here. And what's new for 2019, which is a little feature that I like, is that it'll give me a list of possible format specifiers that I can use. And if, you don't, if you're unfamiliar with what some of these are, instead of having to look them up in your local web browser, it will quickly tell you what it's going to do. So if I wanted to remove the quotes around this string, then I can do NQ and hit Enter, and then it'll remove the quotes around that string. So super great. All right, and then from there, the next thing I want to do is investigate this finished book string call here. Hopefully that's the last function I need to step into. So from there, we're going to, actually, I need to return back to this line. So this is another case of when set to next statement is helpful. And I just dragged the arrow up to the line that I want executed next. And from there, we're going to go step into specific and go to finish book string. And here it'll take me to this function call. More concatenation going on here. And also what's cool about return value here is that I can break down this um, particular return value even further. So if I am not interested in seeing the full string, but I'd like to see what each individual uh, variable here is being returned, I can use return value one, which will give me the title that's being returned. I can also use return value three, which will give me the date. So that's super nice. Again, don't have to stop debugging and set another variable and all that jazz. So in my case, I want to add the time to this date. And I think it has to do with this too short date string here. So I can just remove this, and I should get the time as a result. And if I restart, then I should get what I want. Fingers crossed. Yep, fingers crossed. You know, it's always that moment of truth when you're waiting for it to compile and waiting for the whole project to load. All right. So we can add this book, Love in the Time of Cholera, which I have heard of, ha have no idea what it's about, but whatever. <laughs> let's, let's lie and say I finished it. <laughs> Doesn't sound very good. I love yeah. the cholera. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. Cool. And uh, this time I get the date that I finished the book as well as the time, which is exactly what I wanted. So that was step into specific and return value, two nice little things that Maybe you don't think about at first glance, but can quickly get on your nerves whenever you need to step into a nested function call or um, you just want to see the return value without having to set unnecessary variables. This can save you the frustration. And that concludes all my bugs. So now I'm going to pass the torch on to you because you Wait, probably you have fixed bugs. everything? Yeah, I fixed everything. Even the ones I introduced? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's you put this on to seven that. if you can. Yep. I think I'm seven. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Ooh, let's knock over my glass of water. That'll help things. 
So, okay, so I've been working on this app as well, and one thing I really wanted to do was add something to this app that showed, you know when you look at those books, I just want to see a little like a rating, like if you're familiar with Goodreads or something like that, it simply just shows you the rating of the book, so if I should decide if I should look at it. So to do that, I've added uh, or making use of a, a web API, like a, a, you know, just a regular JSON REST API. But since this is the 21st century, I decided to use async. So who here all is using await? Pretty much everyone should be. If not, you really need to check it out. Like it's especially important in these sort of scenarios where you're making a request, like in this case to another resource, you know, on the network, somewhere else. You don't want to have your thread blocked waiting for a response. So the nice thing about await is it makes it really easy at design time. You know, it's a single keyword, but then you'll start to notice, like, hey, I've got to add async, and then you start to have to, you know, add tasks for everything. It's like a little virus. Once you add it somewhere, you have to add it all the way back to the root, um, which is really important because otherwise, only the single operation is going to be asynchronous, and you're not really going to get as much value. Uh, so I've gone ahead and done that, and let's go ahead and launch this application. And then we'll just go look at that uh, book rating page again. So as I was saying, the nice thing about await, super easy at design time, you just type, but at runtime, these things can be a little bit trickier to debug. And so in Visual Studio, we want to make sure you have a better experience debugging asynchronous code since obviously it's more and more prevalent these days. So firstly, who's seen this page? <laughs> only like 10% of the audience <laughs> have had an unhandled <laughs> ASP.NET error. Only 10% of you must write ASP.NET code then. Um, <laughs> So this page obviously is shown like, you know, it gives you a bit of information. There's some obviously source line stuff in there, but who's been able to debug an issue by looking at this page? Anyone? No, no, it confuses the hell out of me too. Um, and so like, I'm an old school Visual Studio developer and I've been a Visual Studio developer for a while, so I wasn't expecting this. Like the experience I expect if I go back, so, oh, this is actually the, the deployed site, so let's not look at that one. Let's go back, and I've introduced another bug just to show this, uh, what I expect to happen. So normally if you write like non-asynchronous code, this is what you expect to happen, right? The unhandled error is stopped, you're in the debugger, you're where you expect to be, you're debugging your application. So unfortunately, um, the use of await and uh, you know, the, the asynchronous nature of this, oops, didn't mean to stop it, has added a bunch more complexity to the application at runtime. And that means that you know, Visual Studio isn't able to track necessarily the exceptions the same way it does for synchronous errors. So, I'm sorry? No, never mind. So um, once you have this page, uh, what's happening is the error is being handled. Like some of that framework code or some of the runtime code that handles or gives you that awesome management of threads and stuff is actually obscuring the error. So there's a couple of solutions to this problem to get that experience I expect in Visual Studio. The first one is to use the big ban hammer and turn on first chance exceptions, uh, or as we call them in Visual Studio, break when thrown. Has anyone seen this before, break when thrown? Few people, really handy for this scenario. Um, so you just turn it on, and now of course when I refresh the page, what this will do, let's just close this website because I can like keep clicking on it, um, will stop at that exception. The downside of this is that this will stop every time, not just for this particular case, so here you can see I'm at the right place, which is good. You know, I can debug this now. But what happens, of course, is I continue. You know, each time, this, each time that framework code, that wrapper code handles this, it's throwing an exception. So each time I'm going to stop all the way through my application. And if, if per chance I had an application that didn't use exceptions exceptionally, like you know, sometimes perhaps people use them for feature detection or other things, then I'm going to stop on those. And it's a really frustrating experience. You end up stopping an awful lot. Um, so the plus side about the first chance exceptions and using those is that it's available for everybody that's been around for a long, long time. The downside is your experience debugging gets a lot more noisy. You end up like stopping the debugger a lot more times than you care about. So to make this a bit easier, uh, I'm going to turn the exceptions back to normal. And since I never remember what they all are, there's a handy like restore to defaults thing here. Um, so it just puts everything back to normal, which is good because, yeah, I don't know, like each of these exceptions, if you can remember the state for these little things, there's a lot of them. It's actually only the XAML ones that are enabled by default. Uh, so the next feature I want to show you is uh, a feature that's part of uh, IntelliTrace. So it, we call it IntelliTrace uh, Snapshots. So this is off by default, um, so you have to turn it on. 
So let me make sure using that awesome By search. By the way, that search feature is awesome. Like, I can't tell you how many times I use it. We work on the product, and we don't know where half of the features are. Like, <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> yeah, there is something to be said that there's an awful lot of stuff buried in context menus, uh, and sometimes hierarchical context menus. We are definitely guilty of that. Uh, so, yeah. The, so this setting here, IntelliTrace, is, is, you might have seen from Enterprise, it has a bunch of different modes. The one that most people see is on the diagnostic tools window. You get events that come in. Uh, but this particular mode uh, is called IntelliTrace Snapshot. So I'm going to make sure that was on, which it already was. Uh, and this works for both uh, managed code and for native code for C++. And it powers a couple of features that I'm about to show. But firstly, you might be asking, what's a snapshot? That's a very good question. Um, so the reason we chose a snapshot, well, it kind of think of it as a picture. Uh, like it's a picture of your application at a point in time. Um, so it's almost like we've taken a picture of your application and we saved it somewhere so that you can look at it later. Um, and kind of like CSS style, uh, CSS, CSI style, you can zoom in and you can get lots more data out of that, but it's just a point in time. Like you can use all the features in VS, uh, like the watch windows and stuff, but it's still just a point in time. You can't see what happened before and you can't see what happened after. So that's kind of why it's called a snapshot. Uh, we take suggestions for names, by the way. <laughs> Pop by the booth. Um, so what you can see here, this is the diagnostic tools window. Uh, and so let me just filter that, because you can also just type to filter. And so what you can see is each of the exceptions um, that was thrown uh, in this, just, you know, there's just three methods involved here, has got an exception. But if you're very eagle-eyed, there's a little camera here. Can anyone see that? No, not a surprise. <laughs> OK. But if you click on it, it's there. So when you activate it, what this will do is we took a snapshot when that exception happened. So VS is listening, the debugger is listening, and every time an exception happens, we take these snapshots. And so in this case, all I've done is activated that one, and I'm now pointing Visual Studio back at that. But the interesting thing here is your ASP.NET page has been served, right? The request, sorry, the response has been rendered and sent across the wire. But back in Visual Studio, I'm sat at the location that actually originated that exception. So I can go back and use the normal debugging experiences that you'd expect when an exception. So again, you can obviously uh, look at the exception in the watch window, or in the autos even. So if you ever use the watch window, then you want to look at an exception value. There is also a pseudo variable for dollar exception. And then again, that's the exception. And you can just you know, look around, use all the normal features you'd expect with a debugger. So that's really handy in scenarios where exceptions are happening, but you want your application to continue, or for some other reason. Um, and again, this works for managed code for all project types, uh, not just um, ASP.NET, where we're sharing it right now, but for WinForms and everything. So this is kind of like how Step Back works, right? Yeah. In fact, that might just be the next demo, um, coincidentally enough. Oh, wow. Demo two. Yeah. See, what I do you know? <laughs> <laughs> all these convenient things in the code. Um, so the next feature I want to show is another extension of the, the snapshots. So let's just continue, because we're, you know, we're not interested in this anymore. And then let's just go back and click it again. So this time, uh, we've stopped at the breakpoint just as you normally expect. Uh, one teeny thing, um, if anyone's ever wondered what this blue icon was in the tiny, tiny corner when your uh, stops at breakpoint, it means your thread has been switched since the last time you stopped in the debugger. Uh, so generally, as a managed developer, you probably don't care because you're using thread pool queues or whatever, or like await in this case. Um, but underneath you, the thread ID is obviously uh, you know, from, the, from the windows um, can change. Um, so that's really important, especially for native developers, but for managed developers, perhaps less so. So now I'm just stopped as regular. So I'm just going to continue stepping and stepping. And so one thing uh, that you might have noticed, if I just clear this out, is as I step, we also take it, these snapshots. So this allows me to go back. So up here, do I dare press magnifier? This is always a crapshoot. <laughs> So up here, uh, there's a step backward button. So right next to the normal stepping arrows you're used to, there's a step back. And what that does is very conveniently allows me to go back to the previous state of my application. So if you've ever uh, been stepping through code, um, you have something here, you step, 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 and you want to see what the value was back up there, say it's get transformed in between, you can just use step back to go to that point in time. And unlike set next statement, this actually does have the full, uh, how should we say, well, it has all the process memory from that point in time. So again, you can evaluate your expressions, your watch window, all that other stuff 
at that point in time. Um, so it's not just you know, changing the, it doesn't change any state in your application, it doesn't change what executes next, it just allows you to go back and see what the state was at that time. That's so great, because like, I could spam F10 and not pay attention, and I've done that so many times, and then I forget, oh, I actually need to go back to that last line, and then I have to do that all over again usually. I yep, like we've so all this, been there. <laughs> this is exactly for that reason. Um, and so you can also, uh, as you use these step things, there's also a step forward. So if you want to redo the action you just did. And of course, you can also uh, say in this particular case, I want to go to the start of you know, where that breakpoint first hit. You see here in the diagnostic tools window, uh, the breakpoint, and I can jump back to that point in time as well. Um, so a really powerful feature for looking at the, the state of your application at different times. Um, and again, this stepping feature also works with native code. Uh, so if you're using C++, you can step and you get the same feature um, that allows you to inspect uh, the state of your application in the past. The one thing, it's not a true time travel debugger. Uh, if some of you might have seen Amanda's demo uh, against Azure. It's not a true time travel debugger like that. It just captures the state between things. So for example, if you step over something, you can't decide to go back and then step into something. Uh, and there's no way for you, if you do something like you change the value of a variable stuff, that doesn't work. It's kind of like a read-only. You know, This isn't back to the future or anything. You can't go back and change your past. It's already happened. You just have a really high fidelity picture of that past that doesn't change, unlike back to the future. <laughs> uh, great movie. Uh, so continuing on from that. So that's the, the first real set of tips I wanted to show today uh, was a bunch of features to help you debug asynchronous code and some of the things uh, in the entire trace we have uh, with the snapshots. So the next thing I want to show you is all around how do you get debugging working in non-local environments. Like, who here has ever said the phrase, it worked on my machine? <laughs> like, I'd expect a lot more hands. I'm guilty of sin <laughs> of that. Um, and yeah, if you all... didn't raise your hand, I will be asking you questions. Like, what? How? <laughs> it's pretty impressive. So we've all been there. Things have worked great on your local machine, where you have a really rich debugging environment and stuff like that. But perhaps it's gone to a CI or a staging environment or whatever else just not here, and it's not working so great for whatever reason. More difficult to debug, right? OK, well, it is for me. Um, and so one of the challenges of that is some of the same tools you have for Visual Studio aren't necessarily there. So the first few things I want to show you is I wanted to do a tip about like, how you can debug some of these remote things. Um, so firstly, I assume everyone's familiar with MSVS on remote tools. If not, like Windows remote debugging, Google it. There's t uh, use your favorite search engine. Um, there's tons of content for that. But who here is using .NET Core? Considering using .NET Core? It's the future. Um, and who here is looking at like, running Linux containers, .NET Core inside Linux, like in, in either Kubernetes or just a regular environment? So one of the things you might be wondering is how do I debug that? So one thing that's perhaps less well known for Visual Studio, because we're obviously really known for Windows, is actually for, um, uh, for for debugging things running on Linux, we actually have a really good solution. Uh, if you can get an SSH, so again, in this attached to process dialog, if you look at the connection type, in here we have this thing buried, uh, which is SSH. And so that, you know, if you can get a connection to Visual Studio through the firewall, through whatever network you have, whatever you're debugging, uh, we can connect to that device and we will push um, the remote debugger agent. So if you're on Windows today, actually, you have to install, except for some UWP scenarios, you have to install MSVS Mon and set it up and run it yourself. Uh, but with Linux, we'll just push it, put, use SSH, push it out, set it up, and bootstrap it. So you just type in the IP address, and you can debug your .NET code running in Linux uh, really easily. Um, so if you ever have it to you know, debug one of those containers, that's one way. There's also container tools, uh, which I think there's another talk on. So between MSVS Mon and SSH debugging, that covers Windows and Linux in places where you own the box, where you can log into the box, you have admin, root access, whatever. But in many places, you're using uh, managed environments. Like who here is using like, Azure App Services or something like that? You can't in those environments just remote desktop into them. That's not how they work. So for those environments, the most important tool to use to get access to a lot of the features in Visual Studio is Cloud Explorer over here. So if we just log a Cloud Explorer and hope I didn't have all my resources shown, else we'll just have to wait for them. And so again, in Cloud Explorer, as you select like your app services, so here if I just select this particular app I'm deploying, which is like reading list something number, you'll see da -da 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 not deployed more than once before. You can see here that there's a bunch of tools available, and one of them, these page in unfortunately, there's a little like check to see if it's supported, um, is the remote debugger. 
And so if you just click on one of these, we'll, but basically here normally you'd expect to see attach the debugger. And from Visual Studio, what we'll do is we'll push the debugger. So even if you haven't enabled it in the portal and stuff like that, we'll push the debugger and attach to it. Um, there's a couple of caveats when you're debugging things like app services, though. Um, obviously, this is a remote debugger, so I'd never, ever, ever suggest you use the remote debugger on something where anyone cares about it. Like, the debugger is going to stop your application. If you're debugging an issue, it's like a small fire, you attach a debugger to it, you're just lighting that fire with gasoline. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a serious problem. Uh, the debugger, the way it works, obviously, is we pause, you know, when you stop at a breakpoint, we stop everything. We don't care. Um, and so we stop everything. Um, so really, this should only be used in cases where you're directly the only one that cares about this thing. You know, like, unless you're really, really desperate. Um, what if I'm an enterprise user? Yeah, so in, in a couple of seconds, there's a couple of features that overcome that particular problem that we have in Visual Studio. And the other problem with things like app services is the remote, de sorry, the remote debugger is all built around the idea of me debugging a process or several processes, but it's not really like distributed. Like most apps that you care about probably run on one, more than one instance, more than one node. You're certainly not going to have very good availability if you only have one machine in one instance. Um, and so the remote debugger, when you debug your app service, if you've done this in the past, will actually just pick one node at random, and that will become the victim, quote, quote. And then any traffic that goes to that is being debugged. But the other you know, nodes are still going. Um, so it creates a bit of a problem in the sense that things will now just randomly fail. And the other problem, of course, is that the traffic may not go to the place where you're debugging. Um, so it's a bit of a crapshoot. Um, so we do have tools to improve that. But before I get there, the third thing I wanted to talk about, oh, and now this is here, was that another challenge when you come to debug code that isn't local. Local has a huge advantage. You press F5, we build, so that generates the executable files, the assemblies, as well as generating those symbols, those PDB files. The downside when you're, you know, have a remote thing is that there's some code, it's deployed from somewhere, um, you know, and it's, it has symbols that are somewhere. And so you have to find those things. You know, the debugger, to be successful, needs three things. It needs source, symbols, and the thing to debug, the executables, the assemblies. And so you need to solve those three problems. And if you know, you're a developer, you probably have a feature branch you're working out of or something like that. And so, of course, whatever you have locally is probably not matching the server. Both the symbols are probably not matching as well as uh, the, the, the source. Of course, that kind of depends on your environment. So often what happens is, who's here seen this little breakpoint warning? No. Yeah? Did you, and you all know you can override this with this thing here. So again, this is also a crapshoot, because what will happen is if you press that button, is VS will go like, hey, the IL offsets that correspond to line 30, set a breakpoint there, whatever it is. Um, and you, know, you may or may not hit it, depending where your changes in your file are. Um, so that's not too great. Um, so the first few tips, one, you can deploy your symbols with your application. In fact, we changed some of the defaults in Visual Studio to deploy PDBs with your application. Um, so long as your IS or whatever is set up super crazy, it's not going to serve those to any customer. Um, and if it is, you should probably change that setting anyway. Um, so put the symbols next to the executables. That's also useful for other tools, not just Visual Studios. Profilers and some other things make use of that metadata. Um, and that solves the symbols problem. You, if you can't do that, there's also symbol servers and stuff like that. Uh, the third thing of source, like how do I get the matching source? So there's a feature we added in Visual Studio recently, um, if I just get it in the NuGet package, called manage NuGet packages. Um, and this is a pre-release feature, um, so you have to tick that nice pre-release box. And if I can type, no, I can't. So what I'm gonna do is I put this into Notepad on the expectation that I can't type. <laughs> I never use a laptop keyboard. I have a nice natural keyboard. I can't do this. Uh, and the function keys, I don't dare press in case I press the undock button. So apologies. Um, so what you'll see is this feature called source link. Um, and so this works for GitHub, uh, VSTS, Bitbucket. In fact, let's minimize this window so you can just read those for yourselves. And so what this does, what a feature called source link does, is it stamps the source that was used to build um, the, the executables and the symbols inside the symbol and, and then inside the PDB, and a little format that a debugger reads out. So if you've ever, say, using GitHub, and you know GitHub has like those raw URLs where they have like the commit hash and stuff like that, it basically embeds that inside the PDB so that the debugger can then later on go like, hey, the checksum for this file doesn't match or whatever, where do I go get said source file? And so in Visual Studio, we go ahead and get those. Uh, we support a bunch of source providers that are up here. And we also support authentication. So obviously not all your projects are out in the you know, open. 
you have uh, probably some sort of authentication behind them and stuff like that. Um, so we support that just like the rest of VS does. Uh, if you want more information on source links, though, uh, use your favorite search engine, and it's all up on GitHub. So you know you can find there's a few optional parameters you can send up, um, but really just including the NuGet package. The reason I mention this as a tip is you can't do this after the fact. You know, once your stuff's out and deployed, you know the only way you can make this change is by rebuilding and redeploying. Um, so it's good to have this sort of thing prepped in advance. And all this can be authenticated in the IDE, right? Yep, exactly. So it uses my login credentials in the IDE. So the last feature I want to show uh, is something called the snapshot debugger. Um, so this is kind of designed to overcome some of those drawbacks of remote debugging that we talked about. You know, we obviously don't want you pouring gasoline on a fire. We'd prefer you to pour water. Uh, as long as it's not electric fire, then use something else. Um, but we prefer to give you tools to put out fires rather than start new ones for you. Um, so for the snapshot debugger, we support debugging app services, AKS, so like containers, like Linux containers, uh, as well as VMs. And so I'm just going to go ahead and attach to my app. Of course, I could select an existing one and stuff like that. But since we're a bit short on time, we just go ahead and attach. And so the big thing about the snapshot debugger, it overcomes two of the challenges of remote debugging in a really big way. The first one, it doesn't ever stop your application. The whole point of it is that it takes those snapshots we talked about earlier, remotely in this scenario, clearly, but it takes them without ever stopping your application. Um, so your application can keep going and you know, serving requests, people can be happy, et cetera. The other thing it solves is it also listens on all those nodes that are deployed. So if you have like four nodes or whatever number of nodes in your app service, they will all be like listening uh, for the snapshot debugger. And so it's not just the one. And so now if I just go ahead and very quickly uh, set what we call a snap point. No, I already had one. Let's do that again. Um, so another type of icon, uh, this time it's a hexagon, a purple one. Um, and this indicates a snap point. So the, the, the thing you have to do with the snapshot debugger is you have to tell it when to collect data. Because we're taking pictures, right? And we have to know when. And so an obvious way to do that is code. And the second, probably most, or maybe more important, is you can set conditions. So obviously, perhaps you don't want to get everything all the time. You want to have it like when user is null or something, you know, whatever it depends on your situation. So unlike breakpoints, once it's set here, um, there's a little warning telling me, hey, I need to deploy it. Um, that's because like the snapshot needs to, these snap points need to go up to the cloud, um, so the cloud, you know, the app deployed in Azure can be waiting for when they're hit. So now if I go back to the application, refresh. And hopefully, well, that page works, yay. Go back to Visual Studio. This is where the demo failed. Let's just try one more time, make sure I'm connected to the right Azure resource. <laughs> uh, OK. OK, so I think, uh, so yeah. So duh, 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 what should have happened um, is here I would have. <laughs> <laughs> it had to happen at some point. Probably. I know, it had to happen at some point. <laughs> this is what happens when you have like six things deployed and you're not sure which one went where <laughs> um, for demos. So what happens is over here on the right-hand side, you'll see a snapshot, and you'll just double-click on that. And again, it will look like a regular debugging session. You'll be pointing to that point of time, um, and you'll be able to inspect objects. The last feature that's actually I personally find more useful in snapshots is who here has ever said, like, been looking at a log? You've been looking at a log to try to fix out an issue. Uh, you know, it could have been in some fancy graph, visualizer, or wherever. But who here, oh, actually, it came back. Oh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> it was just slow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so this is another thing. When you're doing demos on a Wi-Fi conference network, <laughs> be warned. Um, so that's really, oof. Uh, so the, we'll quickly talk about the next thing, because we have a minute left. Um, so you can also, in the snapshot debugger, instruct it not to take snapshots, but add logging messages. So here it uses logging in production. Yeah, how often have you collected data that you've never looked at? <laughs> Everything is basically never looked at if you're anything like me, except when you need it, and then what you need is not in there. <laughs> or at least that's my experience of logs. Um, because even though they're great, the last time someone had a problem, they added one, but that only helped me the last time, and now I have a different problem. Um, so a valuable thing to do here in um, the, the snapshot debugger is you can, much like the trace points Leslie showed you locally, you can use those on the cloud um, with two very important caveats. The first one is that you can send that message back to the output window, which is useful, but probably not the most useful thing. But what you can also do is if you're using um, like some of the diagnostic APIs in .NET um, or even many of the logging frameworks out there, they'll send a message to here, and the snapshot debugger will do the same thing 
so that the message should get back in your logs. So if you're using some sort of ELK stack or some other stack to look at your logs, um, we'll inject uh, the message the same way that many of the logging providers do, so that message will turn up back in your logs where you can query it and see it alongside your other logs. Um, and so I wish I stopped at a place that had some code, but we can just say hello for the sake of argument. <laughs> Sweet message. And again, what's cool is that the end user can still interact with your app and be none the wiser if, as long as they're not using the bug related portions of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the bug is on fire, still on yeah, fire. Yeah, like, eventually. <laughs> so, yeah, so hopefully that will come back in a few seconds uh, with the log message, and they'll also go um, to my stack, uh, to my logging infrastructure. So, okay, we're at time, um, so I just want to quickly wrap up. So those are some of the features in Visual Studio. For Azure specifically, there's obviously Azure Monitor and a tons of valuable stuff there for profiling. They also have an always listening stat snapshot. Um, so what they do is when you have an unhandled exception uh, in your Azure application, they take snapshots and they uh, you know, categorize them along with the rest of the error data you get from App Insights and Azure Monitor. Um, and you can also use Visual Studio to debug those. Um, and they have a view in as well in the portal. And they also have profiling. So if you want to profile your live application, which is really useful because profiling ASP.NET applications locally is probably not very interesting unless you can press F5 really fast. Um, joking, you do simulators. But uh, so you can start a profile in the production environment and get real data. So, but with that, let's skip to the last slide. So yep. we only had two slides. Yeah, yep, two slides. Sorry for all the people out there who love slides. Um, we're kind of lacking in the slide department. But we do have some calls to action. So first, Go check out 2019. Visual Studio 2019 has a lot to offer. We talked about data breakpoints, search, um, the new features available for snapshot debugging. We still have time travel debugging, which we didn't show here, but um, I think Amanda did in her keynote. And it's currently in preview. So if you have any feedback on that and you just want to tr play around with it, definitely go check that out. Also, if you want to take part in research or give us your feedback, all of it is totally accepted. We're always trying to look at how we can make the debugger be even better than it already yeah. is. We're always and looking to talk to people about things we're thinking about doing. So there's just a survey monkey form. Fill it in if you're interested in having one of us reach out to you at some point in the future and ask you some crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, we're going to leave this page up uh, at the very end. So if you want to just cont contact us directly or tweet at us, feel free. And uh, also, last but not least, if you're interested in playing around using the repo that um, I use personally, I know you had a fork version of it. Um, here's the link, so you can take a picture of that and feel free to fork the repo. It's public. Cool. And that concludes our talk. We hope everybody learned at least one thing new in debugging land. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so feel free to come and ask questions, and we'll be at the booth tomorrow. I think the expo closed at 6, so the booths are yep. closed at the moment. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you.